sorry. Hello. and thank you for joining us for our worship as we celebrate today the Feast of the Epiphany, a really extraordinary and wonderful time. I am sorry that the weather has not cooperated, and so uh, I'm hoping that lots of friends are joining us from home today, and so we pray that our worship is meaningful to you and your life and faith. Um, however, I am so thankful for the stalwart souls who have gathered here today, and I am sure that you will sing with unbounded glee so that all our friends watching at home will not only see the backs of your heads, but also they will hear your voices raised in song and praise. Uh, the, the Epiphany is an exciting time when we celebrate the arrival of those magi, the wise men from a far off place. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to my sermon. But I'm really delighted that you have come, some of you from a far off place, and some of you from a place closer by, uh, but you have come today together for worship, and so uh, as we have gathered, we begin as we always do, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin. Receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. My brothers and sisters, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn today is the first Noel.
grace, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As our hymn of praise today, we once more sing the first verse of hymn number 275, Angels from the Realms of Glory. this day revealed your only begotten son to the nations by the guiding of a star grant in your mercy that we who know you already by faith may be brought to the bold to behold the beauty and your sublime glory through our lord jesus christ your son who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the holy spirit one god forever and ever amen you may be seated The first reading is from Isaiah 60, 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around, they all gather together. They came, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, for those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Ephesians 3, 1 through 12. This is the reason that I, am, I Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to those rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> for this, the Feast of 
the epiphany comes to us from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and the learned from them to and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent to them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, you, to you, O Christ. You may be seated. For my friends who are at home, um, we have no children in the sanctuary today, or at least no adults who will admit to being children at heart that I know of. So I'm going to dispense with the children's sermon, but I would remind you that this is the Feast of the Epiphany. The star guides us, and my children's sermon at 8 o'clock was about the star on top of our Christmas tree here in church, and how it also uh, reminds us that Jesus is above all things. So there you go, the cliff notes of the children's sermon. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks this day for watching over us. We give you thanks for the extraordinary gift of your word. We also give you thanks that you've gathered us here to share in this extraordinary meal, the body and blood of Jesus. As we receive the gifts of his word and of his word made flesh in the Holy Communion, help us this day to be like those wise men of old. Help us to seek him each and every day and help us to give glory to you, O oh God, and to share what we have learned with those around us. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I love the Feast of the Epiphany. I love everything about sharing with you this great joy that I have in talking about the Feast of the Epiphany. I love that God uses these mysterious men from a far off place and he draws them into the story as he draws you and I into the story of who this Jesus is and what Jesus will mean for you and for me. And most importantly, what Jesus means for the world around us. It's an extraordinary gift, to be sure. Now, these wise men, according to church tradition, were named Balthazar, Caspar, and Melchior. Now, it doesn't really matter if those were their names or not. They could just as easily have been Manny, Moe, and Jack. Or for those of you who are of another age, Larry, Moe, and Curly. They had, they were, we, we believe there were three because there were three gifts, but we don't really know that either. That's all been sort of stuff that we've added afterward as we try to figure this all out. And what I invite you today is to pay close attention to the scriptures. You see, quite frequently, we as people get distracted by parts of the story and fixated on it, and we miss what matters most. So what matters most in this story is not that there were three or seven or 18 or one. What matters is that we know there were more than one because it says in the plural that wise men came from the east. And that's also another point of interest. Believe it or not, I was awake in seminary when we talked about some of this stuff and paying attention. And so what's more appropriate in a Bible study, but important to share on a, fe on a feast day like this, is that just because the scripture says they came from the east, doesn't necessarily mean they came from the east the way you and I think of men who come from the east. 
we automatically assume that must mean that these men came from Persia or India or some other far off place and as we look at our compass and think about east and west and north and south. But in the scripture, Jerusalem, the place of the temple, is the highest place on earth. And so, for example, when Jesus tells a parable about a man who went down the road to Jericho, he doesn't really mean, actually, Jericho is a higher elevation than Jerusalem in our modern understanding. But that's not what they were talking about. Where the temple is, where God lives, is the place. You also need to know this, that in ancient times, the east was so important because the east is where the sun rises and it sets in the west. And so they anticipated, even now, when the early Christians and the Jews buried people and they believed in the resurrection, they believed that they would rise up and face the east. Even today in the Smithsburg Cemetery, when we bury people in a casket, their heads face the mountain. And well, actually, their feet are toward the mountain so that they might rise up when the caskets get opened on the last day and all people bear witness to the coming of Christ. We all look to the east. Well, that's going to get a little confusing because at some point we're all looking in, you know, as we go around. But you get the idea. So there's something about the east that's important, but it doesn't necessarily mean the east as you and I would think of it. And what matters most about all of that is that those are details that bog people down. And they end up arguing over where these wise people came from. It doesn't matter where they came from. What matters is that God called them. They saw this star that loomed in the sky. They knew of an ancient prophecy wherever it was they lived. And they followed that star. They followed that star and they went in the direction that they thought they would find the new king. And yet there is an important detail that we shouldn't, be, that we shouldn't have lost on us. They followed that star, and at some point they made a wrong turn. They went to Jerusalem, where they knew the king lived, because they expected to find the new king in Jerusalem. Sometimes you and I, on our journey of life, and especially in our journey of faith, we start in the right direction. We have absolutely the best motives. Our hearts are intended to do the right thing. But sometimes we make a misstep. Sometimes we move in the wrong direction, not because we're bad people, not because we're heinously sinful, but because we rely on our own judgments and not on the signs or the word that God sent to us. Had they stayed keenly focused on the star alone, they would not have been sidetracked, I believe, in Jerusalem. They would not have wasted their time going to Herod and perhaps all those innocent babes who were slaughtered later would have been spared. This, too, is another interesting point that people like to get hung up on. Did the wise men actually find them in Bethlehem, or did they find them in Nazareth? Well, it says they found them at the place where the star was. And we also know from the scripture that Joseph heard in a dream from an angel that it was not safe and that he should take his family and flee to Egypt sometime after those wise men had visited. So here we have the important details that point us in probably the right direction. Herod ordered all children under two to be slaughtered because the wise men did take a while to get there, but they also didn't go back to him the way he had thought they would. So who knows how long that he waited before he finally issued his decree. But again, your salvation and mine doesn't depend on where the, exactly those wise men found Jesus. And your salvation and mine doesn't depend on what year Herod gave that decree to order the slaughter of the holy innocents. Our salvation lies in the exact same thing that the wise men found, Jesus. And the truth is God calls you and me, just as he called to these men in ancient times, to come and seek him. And the most extraordinary good news for the entire world is that God called people who were not Jews to come and bear witness to what had happened. Because you see, these wise men are the first outsiders who are called to see what happened. You'll remember the first wave were insiders. They weren't well-born, high-born, high-placed people. They were simple shepherds on a hillside, keeping watch over a flock by night, when the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and the angel proclaimed, be not afraid. In the Old Testament reading today, we heard from Isaiah that God would bring his glory to his people through this promised Messiah. 
Glory in the Old Testament is not just the light. It's also considered to be something heavy and something weighty because the glory of God is like the treasure in the chest that the wise men brought. It's precious. It's not to be squandered. It's meant to be used for the exact thing that it was intended to do. And the glory of God shines forth. And all people everywhere can hear who this Jesus is and know that God loves them and know that there is something extraordinary at work in the world around them, in a world in which we find ourselves, even today, being afraid of the weather, not knowing if we walk out the church door today or not, will we fall flat on our rear ends and hopefully not hit our heads? Will we be able to walk or I'm already walking like a penguin because I wrestled with the snowblower the other day, but obviously by tomorrow I could be walking even worse if I'm still walking. But the point is not any of that. The point is this. God comes to us, and he comes for the whole world. He sent Jesus for everyone who would believe in him, everyone who would respond. There were others who saw that star, but they weren't moved to go and find him. Only these perhaps three wise men from a far off place and their retinue came seeking him, looking for him, not giving up until they found him. How about you and I? In our everyday lives, when things don't turn out the way we had planned them and we end up in the wrong place or with the wrong people even, as the wise men did, do we continue to seek Jesus or do we just give up and walk away? And say, it's too hard. I can't do that. I'm so lost. I can't possibly be found. What will you do? Who will you be? Will you, like those wise men of old, continue to seek Jesus and know in the journey itself, God is at work in you and he's at work in me. As we journey further away from ourselves, seeking God, looking for his guidance, looking for his glory and not our own, something is at work in us in the most wonderful and magnificent way. Paul says a really important line in our epistle lesson today. He says, to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery, hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, did you hear that word? Through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety may now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. When people walk into a church building, into a sanctuary, I hope they believe they'll find Jesus. Now there are multiple ways in this building to find Jesus. You are confronted if you are paying attention and looking up when you walk through the door that the cross is large and it has pride of place right over the Lord's table right over his altar. There is the cross of Jesus. And if you pay attention to nothing else, the cross can speak to you. The most moving thing that we do in the entire year is on Good Friday. When the sanctuary is dark, when there is a black sheer curtain hanging over this apse and people leave in darkness, total darkness in the congregation, but there is one light and it shines from behind the cross. And we find once and for all what ultimately saves us, what guides us, and what ought to be the thing that guides us each and every day. But perhaps if you're a visitor, you didn't just notice the cross. Perhaps you noticed that in the pew, there are Bibles. And if the pastor is too boring, you are more than welcome to open that Bible and read for yourself, and let God speak to you in a way that old windbag never could. Let God speak to you and share with you his life-giving word, his love for you poured out page after page after page. And then you're invited every time we gather for worship, except on Good Friday, to come to this altar rail, to come and kneel, and receive the most extraordinary gifts of his body and blood in the Holy Communion. You are invited to, be, to participate in a foretaste of the great feast that awaits all of us when we close our eyes to this world and open them to a new and radiant vision. Paul writes here, through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known 
to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. You and I are the church. It's our gift and our responsibility to go back out this door and to make known to all the world what it is that happens, not just in this place, but in this place. Because you see, the kingdom of God is not about Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father in a far off place. The kingdom of God is Jesus alive inside of you and I, right here in our hearts, transformed, renewed, refreshed, and ready to take on the world, ready to listen to the sorrow and the pain and the hurt that the world will dish out and give and exchange grace and mercy and hope and joy because the world around us is hungering and thirsting for the light of God, the glory of God, and the hope that we have in Jesus. And you and I have those great treasures. We do not need heavy chests of gold and frankincense and myrrh. We have the most extraordinary riches already as a church, not gold and silver, not what we put in the collection plate, even though we put it to good use. What matters most is what we put into here and into here. And we take out that door and we share with the world. We cannot be a people who just shuffle through. We must be a people who make a difference. We are called by the most high God. He revealed his son to us as he revealed him to those wise men in days of old. And he says to us, like those wise men who went home a different way, you must not Give in to the darkness of this world. Find your own path, but take the light of Christ with you. And let it burn brightly in the world around you. Because the world desperately needs his light. The world desperately needs the exact gifts that you and I have to share that we find in Jesus. The world needs this rich variety of wisdom that the church has. For a time such as this, when people are filled with such uncertainty, when there is such despair brimming around us, we are not filled with despair. We are filled with hope. Even though we may fall down on the ice when we leave this place today, you may fall down watching at home if it's too icy outside your home. If you're like me, you trip over your own feet and you don't even need ice. You can do that in July. But what do we know? God is always there, reaching for us. He may not catch us and cushion the fall the way we'd like, but he'll be there to help us put the pieces back together, to redirect our lives, and to never give up. Because you see, God has given you a high calling. He has given you such an extraordinary treasure in Jesus. And he has asked that you go and share that treasure. Not that you act like a miser and hoard it for yourself, but go and share Go and proclaim to all the world this glory of God, this heavy thing that God has done for you, this beautiful, glorious thing that God has done for all of humanity, this gift in Jesus, the life, the joy, the hope of the world. You see, Jesus is not just as we say in the creed, seated at the right hand of the Father. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And we have a part of him in our hearts each and every day. It's the same place where you hold fast your loved ones, your wife, your husband, your children, your grandparents, your favorite aunt, uncle, or maybe even a strange cousin who just makes you laugh. Whoever it is that you hold in your heart, that's where Jesus lives also. And he stays with us. And we take that treasure and that glory of God and we let it shine. We let it shine through all of the world because the worst thing you can do is know all about Jesus and keep it to yourself. The worst thing that you and I as the church can do is to hunker down and hide behind locked and closed doors because we're afraid of the world outside. That first generation of apostles became holy martyrs Because their love of God and their conviction of who this Jesus is was stronger than the threats of any violence or hurt or pain they might encounter. They went willingly to their death, not because they were sick and twisted, but because there was such hope in their hearts and they believed by the witness of living their lives richly dedicated to Jesus. They would inspire others and help them to know what it meant to be so richly loved. Now what about us? 
What do we do with the glory of God? Do we hide like a child under a blanket or a sheet with a flashlight, trying to look at something we're not supposed to because it's past our bedtime or because we're not supposed to look at it to begin with? Or do we shake off the cover and let that light shine everywhere? You and I, like those ancient men of old who came from a far off place, who followed a star, we have something to guide us to. We have Jesus crucified and raised from the dead. We have Jesus alive inside of us with his light burning in us. And it's our gift to go outside this door, to go outside your door at home, to be in your house, your community, wherever you find yourself, and let the light of Christ shine. Because the light will shine in the darkness, and the darkness will never overcome it. So my friends, I love the Feast of the Epiphany. I love that God revealed his, that his love for his people was so great, it was not to be confined to just the Jews, but all people everywhere who would seek him, who would come to hear about him, who might come to have faith in him, would have their lives transformed. And the world around us is being transformed. I find it fascinating. You know, we don't talk about this a lot, but the number one religion around the world is Christianity. There are more Christians in the entire world than there are members of any other great religion. And we as modern Christians try to be respectful of other people's religions and not say unkind or nasty things. But the most important thing that we do is share the beauty, the joy, and the hope of our own faith in Jesus. The world needs that. And the more it's shared, the more it's embraced. I don't think it's by accident that Christianity declines in Europe where people don't go to church, where people don't seek God, and they think that they can build for themselves a paradise on earth. But where does the church grow? In Africa, where there is pestilence and famine and starvation, where there is all kinds of deprivation, where there are people whose very lives could be demanded of them in the middle of the night when their village is set afire and people come with machetes to hack them apart. There, in the Sudan, the church grows because people long for peace and they long for hope and they long for beauty in the midst of ashes. And you and I have that gift. In South America, the church is growing. And why is that? Because the people need hope. And our Jesus has that hope to offer. In China, under the threat of death, did you hear that? I said death. They're not even playing around anymore. They demolish churches, they burn the buildings down, and they put all the clergy in prison. That's what they do. And yet, the underground church in China today is alive and on fire, not because it's cooperating with the communists, but because it offers hope in the face of unbelievable suffering and brutality that is visited upon its people daily. The church brings hope, and you and I bring hope. In the midst of this suffering that we endure, the grayness that has set in upon our nation and upon the world, you and I have the light of Christ. Take it outside these doors. Let it shine in you in your home, in your workplace, wherever you find yourself. The grocery store is a great place to tell people about Jesus. And never look back. Only look forward. Let him guide you. Let him fill you. And never be afraid. Amen. Our hymn of the day is a, a joyful one, number 302, As with Gladness, Men of Old.
let us join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the church, for the world, and all those who are in need. Holy and ever-living God, we give you thanks this day for the guiding of a star which beckoned and called to men in ancient times to rouse themselves and to follow wherever it would lead. We, like those ancient men of old, seek you. And like those men of ancient times, sometimes we make missteps and we give you thanks for the grace and mercy of your son, Jesus, who supplies all our needs and who is sufficient for us when we fall short. We give you thanks, O oh God, because Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one to whom the angels sing, and he is the one who saves us. So we give you thanks for Jesus, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be bold in our proclamation to the fallen world around us of the hope, the mercy, the joy we find in your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we have gathered here today, few in number, but perhaps a, a larger number, watching from at home. Help us wherever we find ourselves to remain firmly rooted in you. Help us to know that you are our hope for the future. Not only are you the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, but you are the God to whom all glory comes from the beginning of the ages until the end of time. Help us, O oh God, to share the light of your glory with the world around us struggling with darkness. Where there is despair, help us to bring hope. Where there is bitterness, hurt, and pain, help us to bring healing and joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, today for those who cannot be with us. We pray for all those who are on our list of the sick. We pray for our many friends who are either sick in the hospital or dealing with illness. We give you thanks for your healing mercy. We pray in a special way today for Frank Schaller and also for Frida Burchette in the hospital and very much in need of your healing power poured out in their lives. We pray also for those listed in our list of the sick and those we name either out loud or silently before you now. For Rosie, for Donnie, for Georgia, for Bonnie, Be with them, O oh God. Pour out your healing mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those of us who have gathered in the sanctuary today, watch over us and keep us safe when it's time to go home. We give you thanks for those who put the safety of others ahead of themselves. And so on days like this, we're reminded that there are those who dedicate their life to driving plows and throwing salt and there are others who dedicate every day to ensuring our safety as they wear the uniforms of the police department, the fire department, EMTs, emergency first responders, and the brave men and women of our armed forces. Guard, guide, and protect all of them and bring us all safely to those who love and wait for us at home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer a, a final petition, Lord, one of hope for our dear friend Kim Tantillo, whose mother lost her, her battle here on earth, but has gained a victory in heaven. As Kim, who cared lovingly for her mother, now must deal with her grief and the temporary separation, help her to hold fast to the joy and hope that we find in the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Help her to be transformed in her sadness 
and to find joy and beauty, knowing that her mother now partakes of a banquet that has no end, that she lives in a place where time does not really exist and only goodness is there. Help us all to remain faithful to you so that we might also, when our race is fully run on earth, make our heavenly home with you, the God who has loved us, the God who has claimed us, the God who has revealed his light to all the nations. Help us, O Lord, to put our trust in you for all time and to never look back, only forward to, to you, the one who calls us, to the Lord of lords, the King of kings, in whose name we pray always. Amen. Our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, as he says to us, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. My brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us offer to another sign of God's peace. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Look with favor, Lord God, we pray, on the gifts of your church, in which we in which are offered now not gold or frankincense or myrrh, but gifts of the heart that our Jesus inspires us to bring. And help us to proclaim the sacrifice that Jesus makes for us and for all the world. He is the one who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. 
By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Merciful Lord, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. In great love you sent to us, Jesus, your Son. He reached out to heal the sick and suffering. He preached good news to the poor, and on the cross he opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. My friends, I invite you to join the prayer our Lord taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My friends, the gifts of God for the people of God. You may be seated.
body of Christ given for you. Body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and bring you to everlasting life. Amen. And let us pray. Go before us with heavenly light, O Lord, always and everywhere, that we may perceive, that we may perceive with clear sight and revere with true affection the mystery in which you have called us to participate in the life and the gift of Jesus Christ. And it's through him that we pray. Amen. We are charged with a mission to worship Jesus Christ and to be inspired to respond in love to others. I do have, even though there are only a handful of you in the sanctuary, I'm hoping that we have lots of folks watching at home. And I do have a special reminder for you that we have in just two weeks, I think maybe, we have a congregational meeting coming. And at that time, we're going to have elections for council officer, for ministry chairs. And... It's really important for us to remember the gifts that we have in this church, the extraordinary gift and treasure that Jesus gives to us. It's not in our bank accounts. It's in our hearts, and it's in our willingness to serve. And so it's really important for us to remember that while we have been very blessed to have lots of folks who've worked hard over the years to do certain jobs, it's always a good thing to have new leaders in training. It's always important for new people to be listening with hearts and ears to ask, is God calling me to do something in this congregation and in this place and in this time? And it's a concept that we've talked about at church council called broadening the base of leadership. It's not that we don't appreciate everything that everyone has done all along. Quite to the contrary, we could never, ever have achieved as much as we have as a church without the extraordinary gifts that people have brought as they have given selflessly of themselves over many years. But it's always important for all of us to recognize that we have an important part to play in God's kingdom. And so if you're watching from home, I challenge you in your prayers this week to ask yourself, how is God calling me to serve? Would he like me to step forward as a council candidate? Would he like me to help with one of our ministry groups or perhaps chair them? Ask yourself these important questions. The truth is God needs you now more than ever. So don't shrink away. Don't fall back and just think, well, someone else will always step up and do it. Let that someone be you this time. Let that someone be you, because, not because you feel obligated, but because the joy of the Lord lives in you, and you want to share your hope and what you have received with the world around you through a ministry group, through counsel, whatever it may be that God's calling you to be. But be open and listening for his call. I thank you for taking time to listen to that announcement. Please bow your heads and receive this blessing. May, God, may the blessings of God the Father, who placed in the heavens a star that guided wise men in ancient times to find the infant Jesus, continue to guide you and I through each and every day of our lives so that we also, like those wise men, might seek Jesus. Amen. And may Jesus, the Son of our living God, the one who loves us, the one who sacrificed himself for us. May he bring to us the same joy he brought to those men in ancient times who came to find him. And may we share that joy and his glory with the world around us. Amen. And may the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit poured out on all ages for all time, strengthen you for the journey, continue to live richly within you, giving you hope for the journey. And may he continue to push you on the journey so that you always continue to seek God. 
And may the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen. Our closing in today, brightest and best of the stars of the morning. Peace, Christ is with us. Thanks be to God.